Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Ender's Halo Neuromancers and Witchers, oh my. For the next hour, I am your host, Sean C.W. Korsgaard, assistant editor at Bain Books and longtime MAGFest attendee. I'm also our media and military liaison, but for the next hour, I will be explaining the complicated and interesting history of science fiction and fantasy in publishing and gaming, where they've crossed together, crossed het butted heads, and where they might go from here. Science fiction and fantasy have always found very fertile ground within the field of gaming. Uh, it's ever since people were sending letters to each other. That was actually how some of our earliest board games and tabletop games started, was uh, ex correspondence chess and things of that nature. Gaming has enjoyed a growing role in the style and development of fiction, and likewise, Science fiction and fantasy have played a role in gaming. That strange relationship, though, there's always been one in a position of dominance, and it flips back and forth, depending on which era we are talking about. Now, the other thing is, where do they go from here? What can authors learn today from gaming? What can gamers and game programmers learn from science fiction and fantasy? And where do we, as fans, get to benefit from both? First, we're going to go way back to the 1930s. The foundational texts of early pulp science fiction and fantasy, and some of the first references that, to what we would recognize as gaming today. The, what's considered the first example within science fiction is a short story called Pygmalion Spectacles by a gentleman named Stanley Weinbaum. For anyone curious, that is actually public domain. So. Look that up, it's completely free of charge. The other stuff, though, you have Ray Bradbury's The Velt. Anybody read that in school? I don't know if that's a good or bad thing about the American public school system, but the only one. Good for you, though. Well, I'll give you a reason to read The Velt in a moment, but. Computers and gaming popped up in fiction very early on, before we had video games or even computers. And one of the fascinating things about that is looking at some of the strange things we recognize and some of what we don't. My personal favorite example here is, to use again, Ray Bradbury's The Velt, which is, without spoiling too much, about a nursery that this rich family has built in their home that allows their children to walk into the African savanna. I read that in the short story. Yes, exactly. It's an example of virtual reality gaming without con a lot of stuff we would recognize. No controllers, no system. For that matter, we don't even know if it's powered by electricity. Other early examples, some of which we will talk about a bit later, include Harlan Ellison's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream which is where we get every single evil computer story from. Jerry Pornell and Larry Niven's The Moat in God's Eye, which is actually the first example of a modern computer appearing in a novel. Pornell will be important. We'll talk about him in a bit. And of course, there's Mr. Isaac Asimov. Throw a rock at any of his books and a robot will pop up. <laughs> and then, of course, we have the cyberpunks. More than literary genre, this was an entire subculture, starting around in the 1960s, up to the point it really took off in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It had fashion, architecture, a breathtakingly awful Billy Idol record. Yeah, I, I have a great um, uh, video essay about that on YouTube. I think I've ever done. Is it the Todd in the Shadows one? Yeah, yeah. That poor, poor man. Nevertheless, some of the biggest influence on the cyberpunks wasn't fashion, and thank goodness, not Billy Idol, was science fiction. A lot of it has its roots in what's called the new wave of science fiction, was where you had a lot of contrarian edgelords, as we would call them now, back then. They were just hippies, beatniks, radicals of all types and stripes that pushed the boundaries of what they considered good taste or good mind in science fiction. You had Samuel Delaney with Nova, 
probably the original work of cyberpunk science fiction. Philip K. Dix, Do Androids Dream of Electronic Sheep? Some of you probably recognize that from the Blade Runner movies. If you haven't, give the book a read. It is a very different ride. And the golden age of the genre, though, is bookended by two works. William Gibson's Neuromancer, which opens with one of the greatest lines in all of fiction. The sky was the color of static of an old television set. Evocative, isn't it? And Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. If you ever want a look at, if you start in the early 80s and work your way to the mid 90s, how society's impression and the role of computers within it grows, the cyberpunk movement's actually a really interesting look at that. Neuromancer, Nova, and Snow Crash portray gaming and computers very differently from each other. More on that in a bit, though. Now, for your first chance to win one of these lovely books in front of me, our first trivia question of the evening. What is considered to be, perhaps, if not the first, New York Times bestseller to feature video gaming as a key plot element? Was it A, Neuromancer, B, Ender's Game, C, Snow Crash, D, Consider Plavius, or E, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Who says A? Who says B? Okay, you can't all get a book, but let's see. You, you, and you with the bandana. Come on up. Don't worry, the rest of you will get your chance. Mm -hmm. I brought plenty. Ender's Game. Thank you. It actually first appeared as a short story in the magazine Analog. If you guys aren't reading that magazine today, you should be. Outstanding stuff. And I don't just say that because I review books for them. But it expanded into a full novel that features not only the titular game, uh, spoilers for one of the greatest science fiction novels of all time, by the way, but video games play a key element in the plot, specifically how Ender interacts with this training program during his downtime that turns out to, uh, again, Let's just see a show of hands. Who here has not read Ender's Game? Good Lord! It sold 25 million copies. Where were you guys? Well, without spoiling too much then, the, his role with that training program evolves in each act of the book and it's actually one of the first times you ever see something like a controller appear in a science fiction novel. Notable because this was before home computing was actually really a thing. Ender's Game dropped the same year as the NES. In Japan, mind you, not the US. The US still had another three years on that. But the other way it kind of predicted where we would go is there's a whole subplot revolving Ender's siblings and online communication, blogging, which predictably results in one of them becoming the dictator in charge of the earth. So uh, all of you watching Twitter with interest, uh, ish. Now, why did genre fiction find such fertile ground in gaming? An early reason was many of these authors were themselves computer programmers. Uh, Larry Niven, Jerry Pornell, and Werner Venge. Cornell, who I mentioned earlier, even actually wrote one of the earliest computer guides with those lovely evocative covers of him standing on top of a pile of broken computers with a crowbar in his hand. That quote by him is also in there. Others, like Michael Stackpole, actually worked within the gaming and video game industry themselves. But authors, readers, programmers, and gamers of all types tended to belong to the same circles, and there were a lot of overlapping skills and interests. The other reason was that, with a few exceptions for the time period, you had Star Wars, which was the massive cultural juggernaut it continued to be to this very day, and Conan the Barbarian, which was the rare good fantasy movie, until the ones we'll mention a bit later in the presentation. 
Hollywood wasn't quite ready to bankroll big budget adaptations of genre fiction. And when they did, they were often terrible. Look at all the movies that tried to copy Star Wars and Conan the Barbarian. But for game programmers, especially at the time, there were a lot of tech limitations on storytelling. Those are actual screenshots from games in the 1980s, top of the line games. You uh, don't exactly get the AAA gaming experience out of those. So basing your stuff off of a popular book actually get, gave you more storytelling possibilities. Let the books do the narrative heavy lifting and let you focus on delivering a fun game for the gamers. And of course, money. It made all sides lots of money off licensing, partnerships, and promotion. Now, your second time to possibly come away with a book, unless you got one before. One of the most influential sci-fi novels of all time was adapted into a video game that would become the foundation of the entire real-time strategy genre. Was that novel? A, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. B, Foundation. C, Snow Crash. D, Dune. Or E, Ready Player One. You. You. You in the back. The three of you, come up and get a book if you haven't already. Yes. Although technically, it was called Dune 2. <laughs> Developed by Westwood Studios, this was a side project actually adapted alongside the first Dune video game, which was a less successful adventure title. While it wasn't the first RTS game, part of what made Dune 2 a genre-defining standard was the list of gameplay innovations created within. This included resource gathering, base construction, tech trees, and mouse-based movement commands. Pretty much everything that is to this day the foundation of most of the real-time strategy genre. It was a commercial success. Global sales upward of 250,000 units, which considered just how much money the Dune movie lost was probably the biggest victory that they could have pulled for the 1980s. For those of you who've only seen the new Dune movie, you have no idea how good you have it. <laughs> the result was a, an entire franchise of Dune video games that lasted well into the 90s. And Westwood Studios would use many of these mechanics to develop their own franchise, a little one by the name of Command and Conquer for any fans. Show of hands, who likes Command and Conquer? You don't get a book for it, but pat yourselves on the back. <laughs> Then we enter the 1990s. The success of home consoles really started to play an impact here. The NES, the SNES, the Sega Genesis, not only advanced computing technology, but it meant gaming could achieve new things, that it could do better storytelling, to name one example. For spec fiction, this also caused a boom within video game adaptations of existing books. You see these in Wing Commander, Battletech, and of course, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, written by that Michael Stackpole fellow we mentioned earlier. And of course, this was the era that gave us Snow Crash. Nova or Neuromancer may have influenced the cyberpunk genre more, but in terms of gaming, Snow Crash was the most prophetic. If there was ever a novel that encompassed everything that Maybe we remember or don't remember of the irony-drenched grunge sensibilities of the 90s and the thoughts of how that might apply to cyberspace, that novel is Snow Crash. It also damn near hit the mark perfectly for everything we've come to expect from not only gaming but the internet, web forums, online gaming, social media, and like the world would be VR goggles aside, um, that it would come to encompass every facet of everyday life. It's dated in some other ways. Uh, this was one of those novels where perhaps most emphasisly they all thought the Japanese would own the world by the end of the 1990s. But other aspects are completely mundane. I mean, who after all would want to escape a poor, hopelessly divided, corporate-dominated world into a fictional thing called a metaverse? 
uh, in the event Jeff Zuckerberg watches this, put me in the camps last. <laughs> this is the space where you realize every tech bro that reads a science fiction novel titled something like, do not create the agony matrix, creates the agony matrix. Now, compared to the 80s, which sci-fi had its day in gaming, this is where fantasy really started to take off, as should surprise nobody, as this was the golden age of the SNES JRPG. But likewise, you saw a lot of classic fantasy novels really come into their own as gaming franchises, especially since fantasy in film and television for this time period meant Xena or Hercules. Not exactly the kind of level you want from, say, Wheel of Time or Lord of the Rings. But these included a Discworld video game franchise, a Shannara video game, Wheel of Time, Forgotten Realms, Nine Princes in Amber, classics of the genre adapted to video games that were all widely successful. But the most, the best spec fiction adaptation of the 1990s was a massive flop. And your next chance to come away with a book. What is the work adapted as this video game by a famously grouchy author that is he actually considers the best adaptation of his work? Is it Michael Moorcox, Elric of Mel Nibonet? B, Alan Moore's Watchmen? C, Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers? D, Philip K. Dick's Blade Runner? E, Harlan Ellison's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, you. Come on up and get a book. For those of you who have never played this, and I think it's available on Steam and good old games very cheaply, please do so because it is, oh no, please, please, take the one I wrote, yes. He chose correctly. When I said I don't mind a little ass kissery, I meant it. <laughs> it is a chilling adaptation of the work that not only adapts it faithfully, but builds upon it in some interesting ways. The, as I mentioned earlier, the short, because the surprising thing is this is a short story, not a novel, not a series of novels, a short story. And it's influenced everything from Terminator to Portal as Ellison's long list of lawsuits would attest to that. But that 1995 video game not only earned his blessing, but he actually worked to help them expand the story and provided his own voice to the villainous supercomputer AM, the adaptive manipulator. So when you hear that, hate, let me tell you all the ways I hate you, hate, that is Ellison, and yes, he probably does hate you. <laughs> but everything that made the story famous and made it so evocative is expanded upon in this game. It's grim, graphic, heady. The characters are fleshed out in horrifying new ways, and of course, the most, one of the most terrifying endings of all science fiction is given its defining form. I have no mouth and I must scream. Though a flop at the time, it actually killed its developer, Cyber Dreams, it's now regarded as one of the masterpieces of video games of the era. And again, grab it cheaply while you can, wherever you can, and give it a try, especially if you've never read the story. It's perhaps the best way to experience it. That or renting Terminator. Then we enter the 2000s. Everything began to change with the turn of the millennium. Home consoles and computers became more and more advanced, meaning they could tell more and more advanced stories, which means they could do more storytelling of their own, which means they didn't need to lean so much on books. You also saw a consolidation of publishers within publishing and gaming. This was the era where many publishers actually condensed under one or publisher or another, what we now call the big five within US publishing. With a few exceptions, my publisher included, every publisher within the United States is owned by one of these five companies. Likewise in gaming, 
you had EA and Ubisoft snapping up a lot of these indie companies, especially as, like Cyber Dreams, a lot of them were feast or famine. One game flopping often killed studios. But it still took one game in particular to prove that gaming could build their own genre tent poles. You may begin your Roman chorus now. Halo, Combat Evolved. This was the launching point for one of the most successful video games and media franchises of all time. A game changer not only for video games, but for all of speculative fiction. There had been successful original works of sci-fi and fantasy before this. You can actually, and we will talk a little about this, see the influence of JRPGs starting in fantasy around this time, for just one example. But never this level, especially the sales levels we saw with Halo, five million copies for the first game alone. This was the kind of blockbuster success for a video game that usually was reserved for movies. It was a, also proof that not only that the first person shooter was viable for video games, but you could tell these deep, enriching stories, epic space opera akin to Star Trek or anything you could find on the bookshelves in a video game. And that graphics and system specs would no longer hold them back. But there was one thing that might have held it back. What work of classic science fiction has Halo been accused of largely ripping off, rightly or wrongly, since its exception? Is it? Larry Niven's Ringworld Known Space series. B, David Weber's Honor Harrington series. C, Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers. D, Joe Haldeman's Forever War series. Or E, John Steakley's Armor. You and you. A, Larry Niven's Ringworld. A. Come on up and get books, the both of you. I got a book, can I give it to this guy? He's been trying so hard. Go right ahead, come on up. But let's answer that here and now. Did Halo rip off Ringworld? There are some stunning similarities between the two, between Halo and the known space Ringworld series, beyond just the fact they both feature a giant orbital ring. There's the man Kazin Wars within known space that reflect the human covenant wars. The builders of the ring are also this hinted at race of progenitors that may or may not have held a role in causing mankind's evolution. The short answer is much, much less than earlier versions of Halo ripped off. For example, the Covenant used to be much more feline in form. The Kazen, for those of you who haven't seen the copy of those books we have up here, basically look like giant feral cats. The Covenant, much more reptilian, at least in later versions of the game, and the ones we eventually got. Bungie has always acknowledged Ringworld's influences on Halo. They even offered Niven the chance to handle the official no novelizations. And they even sent him an Xbox with a copy of Halo as a gift. Niven, meanwhile, has also said he has no ill will and praised the game repeatedly over the years. Even as he always says, it's still a poor man's Ringworld. This was the era where video games, as I said, began to become a multi-billion dollar industry. What was once a cult favorite of a few kids and cultish programmers was now a medium that eclipsed the success of not only science fiction publishing, but movies, music, gaming grew bigger than all of them. Where Halo was the first, many would follow in its footsteps. You saw genre tentpole franchises, Elder Scrolls, Bioshock, Mass Effect, pushing the boundaries not only of what a video game could do, but within science fiction and fantasy themselves. And while that loss was palpable, that partnership started to break, spec fiction, at least for the time, thought they'd found greener pastures elsewhere. At last, they had the success in Hollywood they'd long desired. As I mentioned earlier, you didn't see a lot of successful movie adaptations, your Star Wars or Conan aside. Two changed that. The Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter. Both became multi-billion dollar movie franchises that to this day are tentpoles of the entire Warner Brothers studio. 
Now, while there were also some successful literature adaptations of this period, most of them were movie tie-in games. The last dying gasp of the genre in many ways. That Lord of the Rings, Two Towers, and Return of the King game, still classics. But there was another interesting transition, this time in publishing during this time period, where once you had authors who were programmers. This was the era where you really started to see gamers come into it. The generation that built these systems and designed these video games were writing books in the 70s and 80s. Now, the people who played them had their chance at the field. Part of this you can see in the genre's increasing trend towards self-awareness and meta-humor. But a bigger part is that you see a lot of references and Easter eggs. Sometimes this is very exciting. Scott Lynch's Gentleman Bastard series actually names its lead character after Final Fantasy. Thief is referenced throughout the series. Uh, one of my favorite modern science fiction space opera series, the Sun Eater series by Christopher Rocchio, actually references Fire Emblem throughout. For our veterans of MAGFest, you may remember me from such previous MAGFest panels as Together We Ride, 30 Years of Fire Emblem, and Together We Ride Again, Here's More Fire Emblem. <laughs> so I'm all about that. Other times, though, you get stuff like Ready Player One. So, show of hands, who's read this one? We almost had more people read this than Ender's Game. Just go ahead and rip my heart out, guys. <laughs> we almost, we did. Almost, yeah. almost. So now, not to rag on it too much, it's an enjoyable book, and like it or loathe it, there is no denying that it's probably the biggest crossover success between gaming and spec fiction to date. It's also probably one of the, if not the, best-selling novel in science fiction and fantasy of the past decade, even the past 20 years. In raw numbers, it sold more than 5 million copies before the Steven Spielberg movie. But as we entered the 2010s, and I think Ready Player One was 2011 or so, publishing began to stumble. And this is where the House of Cards for publishing really starts to, if not tumble, waver. The lucrative tie-in novel cottage industry that was a mainstay for franchises like Battletech and Wind Commander largely died off. A few stuck around, but ironically, many of those were video game tie-in novels. Halo, Gears of War, there's even a really good Bioshock tie-in novel. Then of course, there was the 900 pound gorilla of the industry, Amazon, hitting it like a hurricane. First, by putting thousands of bookstores out of business, pouring out for Borders Books and your local indie stores, and by offering a viable alternative with self-publishing. For good or for ill, that and there is some outstanding work being done with self-publishing, to be clear, it's still hurting the industry to this day. Sales numbers for publishers really never have recovered. Genre fiction especially, never a gold mine, began losing money. Others closed entirely. We just saw one of the oldest science fiction and fantasy publishers, DAW. Anybody familiar with that brand? We have a couple hands. Don't, that doesn't get you a book, I don't work for them. <laughs> Just got bought by a Chinese company. Others were rolled up. Uh, Del Rey actually just got rebranded as something else. But gaming, on the other hand, the 2010s were a bellwether era, where once gaming proved it could stand next to the big boys, blockbuster movies, hitmaker musicians. Here, Gaming eclipsed them. Video games as an industry today make more money than all of publishing, Hollywood, and music combined. So if we have any game developers in here, pat yourselves on the back. Well done. And the other thing is that Hollywood, once the savior to publishers, is now seen as due to a combination of financial failures and let's just say creative differences in adaptation, 
the relationship has begun to fray. For every Hunger Games or Game of Thrones that adapts faithfully and sells lots and lots of copies of the novels, there are dozens more novels like Ender's Game, John Carter, Wheel of Time, The Shannara Chronicles, A Wrinkle in Time, Rings of Power. Look, when you have studios thinking they know better than Tolkien, Tolkien? you're going to have some people on the outs and looking for alternatives. Which is why it's really nice that one video game in particular rekindled an old partnership. What may 2015 release of a video game adapted from a book caused a 400% increase in sales of the book series and got it a Netflix deal? Was it Game of Thrones? Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege, Shadowrun Hong Kong, The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt, or Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer? You guys laugh, but that was a gripping military science fiction thriller that brought me to tears. Really? No, not really. Okay. It was so fun. Yep. E, Animal Crossing. Were you going to say the same? Wait, did you say Animal Crossing? <laughs> no book for you. Come on up and get a book. You, same answer? Come on up. Can I say C for wishful thinking? Let me check. You know, I'll get that. Come on. Get. I already got it. Good for you. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt was that game, one of several adaptations of Eastern European spec fishing by Eastern European game designers. They, before anybody else, sort of realized a natural partnership. Uh, even beyond the Witcher series, my personal favorite is actually the adaptation of the Metro series, a wonderful series of post-apocalyptic novels by Dmitry Glukowski. CD Projekt Red's series took Andrzej Sapowski's Witcher series, which were a modest success outside of Poland before, and poured gasoline on that fire and turned it into a blaze. English adaptations of the Witcher novels before the games were cult. Usually you'd not even get a trade paperback release. Many of them were straight to mass market. They are now on something like their fifth or sixth printing and just had beautiful hardcovers done by Orbit where they are now a crown jewel of the publisher. What was once cult is now a tentpole because of a video game. And more importantly, tens of millions of copies of Witcher 3 sold. To this date, we're looking at between three, three and five million collective copies of the Witcher novels sold since Witcher 3 released. The Netflix show did not have a similar boost. The Witcher game did. A large, and that 400% increase is larger than margins seen with movies, TV shows, especially bad ones. I'm not allowed to share industry sales numbers, but the sales for the George R. R. Martin's books after the Game of Thrones finale would surprise you. So is there a potential partnership to be renewed here? Several publishers have been courting game developers for adaptations of their back catalog, especially works that are considered too small for Hollywood or the streamers, but aren't compact enough that they can't find more fluid possibilities in video gaming. Multiple works based on works as diverse as Michael Moorcock's Elric of Mel Nibine to Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn are being explored as video games. Other times, you have authors dipping their toes in the ring including one, one George R. R. Martin, who, credit where it's due, I will rag on him for the ending for Game of Thrones, but Elden Ring was fantastic. Still doesn't make up for not having book six. Anyway, for game developers, and especially indie developers, it offers the same advantages it ever did. A pre-existing audience, a story, t a story that's already well beloved by a fan base, unless you figure out some creative ways to program it or make a new game. 
And of course, there is some interesting flowback toward publishing. The lit RPG, perhaps the newest subgenre in publishing. In an attempt to attract gamers and readers, and this is why I don't criticize self-publishing, they were the ones to figure this out first. There was an entire subgenre where indie authors laid the groundwork. A merger of a lot of video game tropes and fantasy and sci-fi standbys. Uh, fact, it's called dungeon lit or level up fiction because a lot of it is focused on things like progression, skills, and I say this out of love. Some of the really bad ones even have characters, oh man, it's like I'm leveling up. Ha ha, check out this new skill. Oh, so it's a little for this time. Oh god, I had not oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it had to be surrendered. Remember what I said about ripping my heart out? <laughs> but interestingly, though, once dominate the indie authors still dominate this space, but the past year and this year, we're actually seeing the first trad publishers dipping their toes in it, and my publisher is actually the one doing it. One of the books you actually see as one of our lovely prizes, Into the Real by Lydia Scherer and John Ringo. The other comes out in March, Time Trials by M.A. Rothman and D.J. Butler. If they prove successful, who knows? We might see the lit RPG really take off within publishing. Yes? Possibly. We can dig into that more, more in the questions, though. Speaking of which, though, we've reached the part where I get to plug my publisher, Bain Books where if you can't tell from the lovely selection of books, I hope all of you pilfer through here because I am parked in the Fleet Street garage and I am not carrying these back. <laughs> we actually give out more than 100 of our books for free on our website. And by the time of our company's 40th anniversary next year, we hope to have 100 more. We are on all relevant social networks, including YouTube, Rumble, and Twitch, where in another interesting possibility of gaming and publishing crossing over, yes, we are dipping our toes in that particular pond. We will see how that works out. Hopefully it won't be my ugly mug on the camera. God help us. But I suspect we have some questions. Whether they be about publishing, spec fiction, gaming, heck, what games I like or think are good examples of storytelling. Let's have at it. I like that question. Which one? What uh, games do you think are good examples of storytelling? Depends on what storytelling you're aiming for. For example, the Do Elden Ring and the series is uh, tongue tied there. The Dark Souls series are minimalist in the ways that you have to pick and dig to find the plot line and story, but I still love them dearly. Meanwhile, Fire Emblem, of all things, the reasons I love it is it's shockingly one of the more accurate portrayals of military life in video games. Anyone who thinks it's not, spend a weekend on a hotel near a military base. You'll come away with a new view on our fighting troops and a venereal disease. <laughs> Uh. Um, going more into that question, uh, what game mechanics would you say lends itself more to uh, books being translated into video games? Like, The Witcher 3 is an action game, it, but it does have very, very rich story. Uh, while the earlier like books that were translated, like I have not have no map in the I must scream is a point clip. Yeah. Um, so what would you say is like the kind of like go towards to Honest action games are way more popular. Honestly, there are a lot of some really creative ways to do it. That's one of the things I do love about indie gaming as a scene, especially today. For example, 
As someone who grew up playing bullet hell games, I really love that indie game developers have really revived that genre from the dead. You don't think I would love to play a Starship Troopers or Honor Harrington bullet hell game? And the best thing is, bullet hell games aren't really heavy on story, but here they would not need to be. Because you have a, in the case of Honor Harrington, a 14 book mainline series, several spin-off novels, a YA tie-in novel series, to tell that story. Just go shoot your enemy spaceships. Or you could go, to use Honor Harrington as another example, a really in-depth combat fleet game where you build your ships, build your fleets, have to plan naval battles in 3D spatial, sp spatial space. It's past midnight. Everyone's a little tired. But honestly, that's one of the areas I think that the game designers will definitely take the lead on, and I really hope that they do continue to put out some really creative stuff. If a farm sim that I love dearly Stardew Valley can sell 20 million copies. Sky's the limit for indie gaming. Yes? Um, going out the way, are there any games that you would love to see turned into books that you can't quite see how they could be? Or any books that you would love to see play the game, but like, how do you turn what makes the book good into a good game? Am I allowed to say my books? <laughs> Okay, I kid, I kid, but... I mean, if you say why, you would start with it. It depends. Like, a lot of military science fiction novels I think would do great for shooters, especially because, I say this out of love, you can really only storm the beaches of Normandy and Call of Duty so many times. And especially the tentpole first-person shooter franchises have really stumbled when they try to go into science fiction. It's a real shame there isn't a decades-long industry within publishing that has told great stories within that subgenre that don't suck and don't star Kevin Spacey. <laughs> but, or, again, go the rich, Witcher route. There is any number of fantasy series where that depth of world building, great characters, could apply themselves to everything from turn-based RPGs to open-world adventure games. and. The only limit is the imagination of the programmers and the willingness of the authors. Any number of possibilities are available, I should say. Yes? I noticed uh, you haven't talked about anything 40K or Warhammer or Frank. They have lots of shovelware in regards to like, some games you produce, but like, they also have, like, like, I know a lot of people that really know that game. So here's where I'm going to get beaten up by some authors I'm friends with. I have never played 40K, I've never read the novels, I've never played the games. Now I respect the hell out of the people who have built that franchise, even if they, uh, the company to be fair, not the authors or the fans, are really big dicks sometimes such as trying to trademark Space Marines. If Robert Heinlein didn't copyright the phrase, Games Workshop does not get to. And as an Elric fan, I will forever love how they stole the entire chaos system from Elric of Melnibene, complete with stealing the symbol, in case you really lacked where they got it from. But 40K, I've heard bad things about the video games, which I'm surprised by, as avid as the tabletop scene is. Maybe they just haven't found the right formula for it. Yes? The basic gist of 40K video games is that um, the company who owns it tends to lend the license out to anybody and everybody, so the quality of the tends to be a very, very bad fire Oh, don't say that. <laughs> And that's, of course, the, that's the danger to farming out IP. Sometimes you get a great partnership like CD Projekt Red and The Witcher. Other times you get Amazon and Rings of Power. No, I will not stop kicking that dead horse. You should. Um, I actually also had one. Um, do you have any thoughts on like, 
what I think is sort of like, it's an interesting place I've seen a few IPs go where like they take this sort of concept of, you know, going from like publishing novels and moving up to like trying more interactive mediums. Um, the thought, the one I'm thinking of is the predecessor to Halo, uh, Marathon, and like the fact that it actually like narratively tied in the fact that the last expansion was a series name with a map building pack. Um, so like multimedia sort of thing. Yeah. We've actually had a few examples of that for a while. Uh, my favorite example is the Shadows of the Empire stuff Star Wars did in the 90s, which had a video game, a book, a comic book series, an action figure line, pretty much everything except from a Star Wars movie, except a movie. And then you have some other stuff like, uh, I'm trying to remember, there was a, some video game series in the mid-2000s, If it should tell you how forgettable it is that I don't remember what it is, that tied into a duology of novels written by Orson Scott Card. No, that was a different video game written by Orson Scott Card, but they tied into, he had a series of novels about a civil war within the United States that actually has a first person shooter tie into them. The game, by all accounts, is terrible. The books, I enjoyed them when I was 17. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Before we have a few more questions, just because I suspect we have a few books there, do we have any veterans of the United States military in the room? Any game developers? First time MAGFest attendees? Which ones of you don't have a book yet? <laughs> Come on up and get one. Any other questions? Yes, you. Speaking of George R. R. Martin's involvement in Elden Ring, do you notice? that all of the uh, royal dynasty of the gods in that game, all of their names start with G, R, and M. <laughs> well, nobody has ever accused Martin of being humble, now have we? <laughs> to give an example, uh, just because, kick again, you don't rag on other authors or other publishers, they're the distinguished competition. On the other hand, George R. R. Martin sleeps on a pile of dragon gold and will never write book six. So I will kick, I will break out the steel toes for his sake. The, uh, I'm trying to think here. Elden Ring was a good little side journey. I liked House of the Dragon, but his reputation among authors is, uh, I won't say who, but one of our authors is actually finishing an epic sword and sorcery series and wants to know if we can clear it with the lawyers that the last book, which is due out probably three years from now, book four comes out next year, will be dedicated as such. Dear George, this is how you finish a series. You complete an utter hack. With love, author's name here. Come on, you gotta have somebody here working for a publisher. Surely we have somebody who has questions about writing or something. Oh, that actually got some hands. You, then you. Uh, I, so, more of a specific question about a book, and kind of like, if you write it, where do you replace it? Uh, book Spares. Have you heard that one? By... Michael, um, uh, Morcock? World of, or, sorry, Michael Marshall Smith. I have not. I've heard of it, though. Uh, I like it, but also I'm not sure if it's just because uh, I feel like it's kind of a, it opens up a very kind of cyberpunk, dystopia, a little surrealistic, but then it just kind of goes off the rails afterwards. But anyhow, um, in a good way, in a really good way. Um, That's the way all good cyberpunk should, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very reminiscent of something that's like, that would be written in the late 80s about kind of uh, some personal fall in Vietnam. Uh, it was like early 2000s. Right? That's a, the date's a little surprising, but we are seeing sort of a really re interesting revival of cyberpunk. There's been some very 
creative new directions and retro throwbacks within the genre. And likewise, you mentioned Vietnam as as awful as 20 years of war has been for the United States military and its countless veterans affected by it, we have had the best crop of military science fiction authors we have ever seen. But related to the topic, many of those same veterans are influenced by first-person shooters. We actually have, in the next year or two, I, just the ones I've read or know of, two or three different series that actually have the respawn mechanic play into military science fiction. What happens in war if you can't die? And I say that not just as somebody who's working on one of them, but anyway, I digress. You had a question. Yeah, um, this might be like kind of a dumb question, but to, to like my question area is about like how like spec fiction is functioning and, and gaming like uh, sort of like, you know, like, like orbit at each other Culturally, I touched on it a little bit, especially as you used to have programmers being the ones writing a lot of these books, and they approached it as programmers do. Now you had ga gamers writing books, and they approached it as people who played those games do. And now, maybe with the lit RPG, we're seeing a synthesis of both, applying those mechanics and that fandom to it. I have the gentleman waving the sign, so any last questions? You, then you, and then rush to take these books, people, please. I am not carrying them back to my car. Are there any series that you know will never, ever get, like, acted, outdated? to like either movies or video games or anything because usually the, the author has given up on adaptations that you would still desperately, desperately want them to make an adaptation. How long do we have? Not long at all. There's a lot of stuff that would do really well, movies or video games especially. I hope that Elric video game comes out. I hope Miss Bourne gets a video game. I would love to see a fleet game from a lot of military science fiction franchises, just to name one. Uh, well, George R. R. Martin Paul is having difficulty with finishing Game of Thrones. Um, I think that he has a lot of things like Dying of the Light that are very good. Do you have any thoughts on that? Or? Oh, yeah, I love a bunch of his other stuff. Uh, one of the greatest science fiction stories of all time was written by Martin. It's called Sand Kings, if you've never read it. Which, if you haven't, do seek it out. It's creepy, it's terrifying, it's gross, it's wonderful. Which, I wish you'd do more of that and less TV shows. But, I have the time warning, so, thank you for joining me. Thank you for hearing me prattle on. And I do have to say, of all the things you could have spent your last night here at MAGFest, I don't know what's wrong with you, but thank you for spending it with me.